little doctrine. And then we're going to take a hard left turn into Bizarro World, and we're going to do a T.D. Jakes, Money Grubbing Televangelist update. And you know, kind of ask the question, what does T.D. Jakes teach about what the purpose of the Bible is you know, in particular portions of it? You, you kind of have to hear this to kind of get what I'm saying. And so we'll be listening to about eight, eight minutes of, uh, of a message delivered by T.D. Jakes entitled, Your Day is Not Over. And it's just kind of the introduction to this message that he's giving, and it's way out there. Way, way out there, but fits with a lot of the stuff that we've been playing recently, uh, where people somehow totally miss the entire point of Scripture. Then, Okay, I, I warned you that uh, we were going to be uh, doing, well, a, kind of an abrupt uh, left turn. And uh, since we're going to be doing a money-grubbing televangelist update... I think it's important that uh, that we. <clears throat> I warned you uh, that we're going to be making these abrupt turns today. Very eclectic program, and uh, since we're changing gears, just get ready for the exact opposite of what you just heard. And to introduce our next segment, here's Doctor T. Don't want no lover. Don't want no kisser. Don't want no gal to call me honey. My name in the Hall of Fame Just want a big fat pile of money Give me that almighty dollar For that lettuce, hear me holler Give me buckets full of ducats Let me walk around and waller in Mazuma El Dinero, wanna be a millionaire Give me money, 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 money I want that green ammunition That's the stuff for which I'm wishing Fill my closets with deposits I'm a demon in addition Give me shackles, give me pesos Let me see their smiling faces Money, 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 money Get me a suit that's made out of loot and whistle for wearing it green. I got that monetary itis like me, just like King Midas. Want that golden touch is what I mean. Give me that old double eagle. Want that tender that is legal and financially substantially. And it's some I can and beagle. Want a living regal splendor for that loving legal tender. Money, 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 money. Greenback collector, I'm a paper bill inspector, I'm a savage for that cabbage man to me is golden nectar. Pour that filthy lucre on me, spread those loving germs upon me. Money, 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 money. And if they ever plant trees of enormous unum, I wanna be the guy that they send out to prove them. Oh, give me my Dr. Teeth and money, money, money. That's our televangelist, money-grubbing televangelist update music. Now, what you're about to hear is a message from T.D. Jakes, and the name of the message is Your Day Is Not Over. And this is just the lead-in to the sermon, but already you can tell that the trap is baited, is probably a right way of putting it, based upon his view of what the purpose of Scripture is and, uh, you know, what he's going to do with it. Now, so what you're going to hear is some hermeneutical gymnastics done by a man who's probably one of the most gifted communicators on the planet. And unfortunately, uh, to go with his gift of communication, he doesn't also have an equal gift of the right handling of God's Word. In fact, quite the opposite. So without any further ado, here's T.D. Jakes to introduce this message of his entitled, Your Day Is Not Over. We're paying attention now, specifically keying in on what's his view of Scripture, and notice we'll notice how he handles it. Here we go. May God bless you on this particular day, as he has never blessed you before. I just believe him for your day. And if you don't mind, I pray for your day today, that God would just strengthen you and bless you in a supernatural way. I'm excited because I have an opportunity to share a word with you that may be contradictory to everything that you see going on in your life. You may feel like you missed your chance, that you messed up, that you blew it, that, that your day is over. Well, you're wrong. This message says your day is not over. God has a plan for you, a comeback, a turnaround, a moment where he brings equilibrium and stability to the adversity in your life. Your day, your day is not over. What? <laughs> um, okay, not sure what he's doing there, 
But this is kind of again, you get some dream destiny, some major purpose, some, and your day's not over. You you can accomplish it, kind of thing. And we've heard this message a thousand different ways from Tuesday and the seeker driven movement and the charismatic movement and the new apostolic reformation. The you know. Word of faith, I mean, it's all over the place, except for historic Orthodox Christianity. Here we go. Ecclesiastes, the great thinker, the great writer, the great sage, identifies a very unique association between purpose and times. Ecclesiastes. It sounds like a train wreck there. Ecclesiastes. So apparently in Ecclesiastes, um, it, it des- describes a con- unique connection between purpose and time. Hmm. He says that there is a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. Yes. There is a time... And a season for every purpose under heaven. In other words, time is born with a twin called purpose. (laughs) In other words, time is born with a twin called purpose. The text that he's referring to, by the way, is a very familiar passage. You familiar with that song, For Everything, Turn, Turn, There is a Season, Turn, Turn? You know, um, yeah, it's from Ecclesiastes, (laughs) sorry, Ecclesiastes. Uh, chapter 3, listen carefully. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under this, under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. So when you put that passage back in context, it's not saying what he's saying. He's just making reference to and hasn't actually read the passage. And now he's making this weird statement. Let me back this up again so you can hear it, because this then forms the foundation for his launching off point from here. Uh, So we continue. Here we go. And a season for every purpose under heaven. In other words, time is born with the twin called purpose. And it is a waste of time to extend days without purpose. Yeah, that's not what Ecclesiastes 3 says. God gives us days then for purpose. The psalmist David said, teach. Did you see how he did that? <laughs> well, there you go. Ecclesiastes, ecle- sorry, Ecclesiastes 3 1 <laughs> is uh, all about who knew, you know, that, uh, that, see, there's a time for purpose. That's what he did with this. So notice he makes a reference to the text, kind of fools around with the text, makes a statement, and then builds on the statement. And now we're to a conclusion that's actually not in the text itself. But this isn't the main part of what I want to focus on. Let me just back up just a little, and then we'll keep going forward. Notice, pay attention to what he thinks the purpose of Scripture is as we go through this soundbite of his. The psalmist David said, Teach me to number my days, O God, that I may know how frail I am. Teach me to count my days, to, to have birthdays and weeks and months, so that I can realize that I am temporal, that I have a limit to how long I can meander, to stop me from wandering, to give me focus, to give me tenacity and commitment and resilience. Teach me. You don't learn that at first. It takes a while to number your days. I guarantee you, you're going to waste a few of them before you begin to appreciate 
I only have a certain amount, and that becomes important. Dates are important. Let's us give us some sort of reference as to where we are in regard to accomplishment of purpose. I was wasn't feeling too good the other day, and I said something to my wife, and my wife, my wife is adamant about this. And, I said, I'm not feeling too good. I, I, I want to take an Advil or something. And she said, I, you know, I, I just look for anything that says Advil and swallow. <laughs> she started snatching up. No, no, that has an expiration date. I would have never known it because I wouldn't have checked the date. I just swallowed the pill. She said, no, it's only good to this date and it's this date over here and... You shouldn't take it past this date. If that is true about medicine, then you must also realize that it is true about life. Um, none of the biblical authors um, had access to Advil or drugs that had a particular use-by date. So I don't know. I'm sorry. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes. Three has nothing to do with Advil and medicines that have a, a, an expiration date, and so now apparently that now there's a principle here that you got to apply to yourself. We continue. Not only through the metaphor that I discussed, but from the scriptures itself, you have an expiration date. Yeah, it's called the day that I die. If you're going to fulfill your purpose, you have to do it within a certain window of time. time. Yeah, that time when you know, you're still breathing. Um, again, um, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes three doesn't teach anything about me having a purpose, and that you know, and that you know, there's a t time twin thing going on with it. Time, purpose, purpose, time, time, purpose, purpose, time. So the, 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 the enemy of this world doesn't have to kill you if he disassociates your sense of purpose from time. Ah, wow, that clever devil. <laughs> Who knew? Just renders you inoperable. The Advil was still there, but it had not been used in time. <laughs> yeah, that was a little demonic laughter, wasn't it? Let me back that up. <laughs> yeah, that ultimately creeped me out there. There are people in this room who are oblivious to purpose and time. But there are many of us who were born with the sense of urgency that we were put here to do something. We, we knew it. We knew it many times. Yeah, boy, how important you must be. We knew it even as children. We knew it even in our foolishness. We knew it even in our wildness. We knew it even in our predicament. We knew it even in our propensity to procrastinate. We still knew that we were put here to do something. That knowledge is what pulls you up out of the gutter of your own human debauchery. It stops you. Not that you're any better than anyone else. It's just that you sense that there is something. Something higher calling you beyond your human proclivities through which a sense mm -hmm. which you say I, I got I got to do something sometimes you don't even know what it is you just know you got to do something sometimes you yeah you got to figure out what that something is though you bet you better ask God to tell you you know through speaking to you through a whisper or a still small voice or something right what is this theology and how is it that this has come to reign as the core theology in evangelicalism? This isn't what the Bible teaches at all. You don't know where you're going, you just know where you've got to go. You, I, I don't know where I'm going, but I can't stay here. I, I don't know who I am, but I figured out who I am not. This is not me. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. No, it's not me. For this task, God has selected Joshua. Now, Moses, to me, is the mighty pastor of the Old Testament. There is none like him. He's a mighty prophet. He's a mighty pastor. He is selected to lead the wandering sheep of Israel through the wilderness of confusion. Deep through the wilderness of confusion. 
confusion. Notice he's already allegorizing the wilderness here. Hmm, okay. So Moses is uh, set to um, lead the people of Israel through the wilderness of confusion, and he's kind of setting up the story of Joshua here. Pay attention to the details as to why God, according to T.D. Jakes, isn't going to allow Moses to be the one to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. Listen to this. Listen to what he does. Detoxing them from their servitude, bringing them into an absoluteness of sonship. Took 40 years for them to begin to recognize you are not owned, but owners. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in time- you know, which passage of scripture says that the children of Israel had to realize that they weren't owned, but owners? I'm not familiar with any of those passages generation had to die out because they were born into an owned situation and they were being translated into an owning situation and when you have been owned sometimes it's hard for your mind to recognize that you have transitioned from being the property to the property owner took about 40 years a lot of wandering a lot of dying and now God said Moses no 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 I can't pause here remember our uh, principle that we uh, used earlier this week uh, the idea that Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. That being the case, what is the reason given in the New Testament as to why the children of Israel died in the wilderness? Was it because they failed to make the transition mentally from being owned to being owners? Is that what the New Testament says? Well, Jude verse 5 makes this clear. Writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jude writes, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, the Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Yeah, that's right. They were destroyed because of unbelief. Not because they were wandering through the wilderness of confusion, having a difficult time making the transition from going from being owned to being owners. So there's a lot of bad theology packed in here, but I'm going to back this up just a hair so that you can then hear the reason why, according to T.D. Jakes, Moses wasn't the one to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. We continue. From being the property to the property owner took about 40 years, a lot of wandering, a lot of dying, and now God said, Moses, you were good to bring them to this point, but now that they are owning and not being owned, I need Joshua because Joshua is a fighter. Uh huh. Do you remember that passage from the Old Testament? Um, where God says to Moses, "You've done a great job, but um, let me let me play the quote so that you can hear it again." Just, I mean, just... you were good to bring them to this point, but now that they are owning and not being owned, I need Joshua because Joshua is a fighter. Mm. Do you remember that passage? Are you familiar with it? I mean, where God says to Moses, um, hey, listen, now that they're owning rather than being owned, hey, listen, I need Joshua to lead the people of Israel into uh, the promised land because he's a fighter and you're not. Does you, rem- you remember where that is? Second Hesitations, chapter 86, I think, you know, something like that. Um, <laughs> it's not in there. It's not in there. That passage isn't in there in the Bible at all. T.D. Jakes just made it up. Just literally just made it up. That dialogue doesn't exist. But there is a passage that does explain why Moses isn't the one leading the children of Israel into the promised land. You can actually find it in the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Numbers. That's right. Numbers chapter 20. I'll start at verse 1. Now the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there, and now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Oh, would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. So then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and, the, and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. And then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And then Moses lifted up his hand, and he struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. So what happened? God said to Moses, Tell the rock, speak to the rock to yield its water. Moses didn't speak to the rock. He struck it, and the first time he struck it, no water came out. You know what he did? He struck it again. This time the water came out, but because, according to the Lord, he did not believe him to uphold the Lord as holy in the eyes of the people, he was therefore punished and said he would not be the one to bring the assembly into the land, into the promised land. That's the reason why. So that's what Scripture says. Here again is what T.D. Jakes said. About 40 years, a lot of wandering, a lot of dying, and now God said, Moses, you were good to bring them to this point, but now that they are owning and not being owned, I need Joshua because Joshua is a fighter. That's blasphemy, isn't it? He's added to Scripture, completely changed the story. But all of that's to set up, then, this idea of what's the purpose of the story of Joshua, then? It's one thing to believe something and wander, but when you get ready to possess it, you got to fight. <laughs> I, I'm going to say it's one thing to believe something and wander, but when you get ready to possess it, you got to fight. You cannot be led by a Moses when it's time to fight. You got to be led by a Joshua because Joshua had a fighting instinct. Mm. So you can't be led by a Moses when it's time to fight. Mm hmm. This is all nonsense. It's false doctrine. This is lying about God and lying about his word. Fighter. If you're a fighter in here, tell somebody say, I'm a fighter. It, 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 that doesn't necessarily mean that, 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 that I'm going to put up my dukes and punch you. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to push you out of your seat. It does mean that if you get in between me and what God has promised me, don't expect me to lay down and let you take over. Are there any fighters in the house? Fought to get up. Fought to finish what you started. Fought to get in the college. Fought to stay in the college. Fought to keep your mind against opposition. You're yeah, um, none of this has anything to do with what the Bible really says. This is false doctrine, filling people's minds with garbage. You, you, you're not there because you weren't in a fight. You had to fight every step of the way to get where you are. And if you're not a fighter, you're not going to finish. You got to be bad. You got to be down with it. You got to be ready come hell or high water. Mm hmm. You got to be ready come hell or high water. What does this have to do with the Bible? What it really says? Absolutely nothing. Joshua. He's in a fight. He's in a fight. And he doesn't exactly know what he's doing. Because sometimes when you're a fighter and you're fighting to accomplish your purpose, you don't exactly know what you're doing. One time he pulls his sword on the angel of God. He's fought so much that anything coming in his direction, he'll tell you. Oh. Being able, he, he says to him, are you for me or against me? You, when, when you've had to fight all of your life, sometimes it's hard to make friends because anybody that gets in close proximity to you, you draw your sword out and say, don't start nothing out. Yeah. 
what does this have to do with Scripture again? Nothing. The idea here is, oh, well, you, you, when you uh, get ready to read the book of Joshua, you, that's the blueprint for how to be a fighter in your life, to take possession, to learn how to be an owner rather than being owned, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Filling these people with absolute nonsense, doctrinal nonsense. The Bible doesn't mean any of this. And the proof for that is the fact that in order to get to this message, he had to lie literally lie, make up stuff about what the biblical text says. That's not rightly handling God's word. That's deceiving. And that is what sends people to hell. All right, we're up on our first break. If you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard on this edition or any previous editions of Fighting for the Faith, you can do so. My email address is talkbackatfightingforthefaith.com or you can subscribe on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash piratechristian or follow me on Twitter, my name there, at piratechristianquick. 